Go to the keyboard and, uh, and the Samuel worshiping, praise the Lord. I was also really touched by the uh, devotional this morning. That was fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's very encouraging. Our testimony can go a long way. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So it's so good to keep sharing our testimonies. Praise God. Welcome to Dominion Miracle Center Church. For all of you, those watching on the internet this morning, we're coming to you live from the Quality Inn here in, uh, 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 on Islington Avenue, just south of the 401 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And we welcome you to come out and join 10 a.m. to 12 noon every Sunday morning. And um, today the name of the sermon is called Healing is the Children's Bread. Praise God. Amen. Day 11th today. I didn't know when I prepared this sermon that I would be preaching it on Mother's Day here in Canada. And I realized though that uh, this story I'm going to start with, Matthew chapter 15, it is a story of, uh, of, uh, of the mother's faith, praise God, a very powerful, bold mother who approached Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Messiah. And if you turn with me to your Bibles in Matthew chapter 15, we're going to read that story this morning as we start off this sermon called Healing is the Children's Bread, praise God. Let's also open up in prayer, Father God, as we uh, get into your word, Lord God. I pray, Father God, you anoint us, Father God. We welcome the power of your Holy Spirit to reveal to us, to teach us, to uh, bring the Rama word out of, uh, out of uh, this topic today, and out of this scripture reading, Lord God. Send your angels to encamp around us, Father God. Bless everyone watching today, Father God. We wish all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day, Father God. We pray for them, Father God for uh, uh, your divine protection, for your divine favor, for blessings, health, wealth, and prosperity. Whoa, thank you, Lord. We release healing today for every mother watching, Lord God. We send forth your word for healing this day, Lord God. We declare that by your stripes, they are healed and made whole. Strengthen them, empower them, Father God, and let them uh, 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 experience your divine love, your agape love this day, Father God. We give you praise and glory and honor, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Amen. Praise God. I'd love to open up in prayer. It gets us a little bit fired up as we get into the word. Amen. Amen. So if we turn to uh, Matthew chapter 15, verses 21, all the way up to 28 or 29. Um, it says here, uh, it, it refers to this woman as a Canaanite woman, or uh, uh, some scripture verse, uh, Bibles th uh, talk about a Syrophoenician woman. We don't know her name, but it says, um, Jesus went out from that area, uh, which was called the region, oh, oh, to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And uh, verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Verse 23, But he answered her not a word. Now, this is very significant here, and you're going to see in the next verse, the first time she approaches Jesus, she says, have mercy on me, son of David. And even though that's an important title for Jesus, he, he does not respond. And, and you'll see a revelation that I just received uh, this morning that um, uh, Jesus was called first to the people of Israel, the lost tribes of Israel, and, uh, and, 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 and then to the Gentiles as well. But you'll see when she changes her wording in the next verse, uh, Jesus does respond. Uh, first of all, uh, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. In verse 24, But Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But verse 23, sorry, 25 says, Then she came and worshipped him. Interesting. The first time she came and said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. But now the second time she comes worshiping him, she was very determined. She was not willing to give up. That's the, uh, the, the, the faith and the power of a praying mother. She says, Lord, help me. Yeah. And, and in verse 26, you'll see Jesus responds now. And I'm challenging everyone watching on the internet right now that uh, it, there's a difference when you call Jesus your Lord and your Savior. That's very important. Now Jesus has to respond. He has no choice because if you just call him by name of Son of David, there's no personal relationship there. Yeah. But when you call him your Lord and your Savior, now you're making a declaration and Jesus will respond to you. Praise God, because you're saying that you've, uh, 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 you know, you've, you've uh, publicly declared him as your Lord. And I believe Jesus will never uh, reject anyone who calls upon him as their own personal Lord and Savior. So Jesus does answer to her this second time saying, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. 
And this may seem like a severe response, but it's because of uh, the calling Jesus had on his life, was, which was to first go to the people of Israel and save them first. But verse 27, she responds in a powerful way saying, Yes, Lord. Again, she calls him Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. In verse 28, then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. That's the key there. Great is her faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Wow. It's a very powerful uh, 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 <laughs> exchange, you know. And I've never had anyone else, like in Scripture, I don't see anyone have that boldness to speak to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in that way, saying, you know, uh, we know who you are. You're the Lord and Savior. And uh, even the crumbs that fall from the table are good enough for us. And, and that was enough response, that humility and that boldness and that great faith. Actually, in Scripture, it was only one other person had that great faith. And it was the Roman centurion, another another Gentile. So it, there's only two times where Jesus says, great is thy faith. And, and there's a lot of examples of faith in the Bible. But those two individuals had great faith. Anyway, the, 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 the topic today is all about healing. And, and the question I think we need to ask is it God's will to afflict his children with any kind of sickness and disease? And I believe the answer is no. Actually, unequivocally no. Anywhere in scripture we see that God wants his people healed, his children healed. Uh, God's nature is healing. And so uh, I, I don't believe we should have any, basically I, I call it zero tolerance for sickness and disease in the body of Christ. Amen. I believe we should pray for everyone to be totally healed, restored, there's a lot of things that go uh, along with that. But uh, the reason I say that is because I believe God's perfect will is found in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. If we're not going to have time to read it today, but if we read Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created the whole universe, all of creation. He created in the six days. On the seventh day, He rested. But He created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it was no sin. Perfect. They, they perfect. fellowship with God. So there was no need for any sickness. There was no need for any disease. Sin had not yet entered into God's perfect creation. Amen? So that's God's perfect will is no sin. The only reason why we have sickness and disease today is that in chapter 3 of Genesis is when sin came into the picture. That's what caused all the rest of uh, what we see today. But God has made a plan where if you turn to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21 and 22... Revelation. We'll see that it, 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 it mirrors almost the Garden of Eden perfectly. God's new creation, God's new heaven and new earth will be created. And we will once again be in God's perfect will. So from the beginning Genesis to Revelation, the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible, I believe are showing God's perfect will for total healing, total health, total restoration and no sin. That's the, 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 uh, the point I'm trying to make today is that we have 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. People say that in total we have 1,189 chapters in the Bible. I don't know if anyone has counted to make sure, <laughs> but we have 1,189 chapters of the Bible, and if you take away the first two and the last two, that's 1,185 chapters of the issue of sin and God's plan of redemption for all of mankind. So the bulk of the Bible is focusing in on what happens in God's permissible will, but not his perfect will. His perfect will is first and last part of the Bible. But I believe Jesus Christ came to solve the problem because in Genesis chapter 3, God already prophesied right away when the very first chapter when sin enters into the world, God made a solution when he said the seed of the woman will be sent to crush the serpent's head. Amen. And so we need to understand that there's a cosmic battle between good and evil. And, and God has already created the solution through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And he's our healer. He's the key. We need to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and your healing will come. You will be healed, set free, and delivered. And God has already made a way. He paid the price for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And He broke the curse at the cross. Galatians chapter 3 is very clear on that. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen. And in fact, <laughs> and I'm taking another bold step to say here, the commandments were only given because of the sin the nature, because of the sin problem, I should say. Without sin, there's no need for the law. Amen? It, did you see any law in the Garden of Eden? No, and I don't think we need the law afterwards because mm -hmm. if there's no sin, there's no need there's for the, the law, law, right? Yeah. <laughs> the law and everything else came into effect just to show that we need redemption because there's a sin problem in the world. 
And so that is the root cause of everything. If we deal and repent of our sin, uh, you will be healed, set free, and delivered. Amen. Uh, but you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because He's God's only plan. God, I always tell people God has no plan B. <laughs> he only has a plan A. And that plan A is sending His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, because He loved the whole world. Jesus Christ came to die for every single human being on the planet Earth. It doesn't matter if you're Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, a uh, Jewish Christian or whatever, Jesus Christ came for everybody. He's the Savior of the entire world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it's by His shed blood that we have remission of sins. So I'm just sending that message out to you today and encouraging you to say that He is the way, the truth, and life. There's no other way. And even now as I'm... Oh, praise God. I'm going to pray for these women, uh, that uh, the girls, sorry, that were um, in northern Nigeria there that were... Um, Kidnapped. This happened three weeks ago and just it hit headline news this week. And I just feel, Lord, we need to lift up these uh, girls to you, Lord God, for their divine protection, Lord God. We send forth the word of God for healing. Send your angels to encamp around them and bless them. Father God, I pray that you will convict the hearts of these perpetrators, Father God, whether they're Muslim extremists or whoever they are, Father God, I pray that you will convict their hearts to turn themselves in and repent of their sin, Father God. And I ask for your full justice. Whoa, thank you, Lord. Release your wrath upon the enemy this day, Father God, and bring total justice, Lord God. Whatever it takes, I thank you, Lord God, that you bring in the UN and whoever else needs to come in to solve this problem and help the Nigerian government, Father God, solve this problem and, and show that we will have a zero tolerance for evil in this world, Father God, that it will be shut down the moment we hear about it, Lord God, and we pray, Lord God, that you will save the souls of these people, Father God. I thank you that you're rising, raising up an army this day to pray, Father God, to solve this problem, Lord God. Thank you, Father. We give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I couldn't help it. I just, uh, on the way here, I heard it on the news again today. And thank God for social media that has made this uh, event public. And it's just amazing the atrocities in the world today. And again, you, it, it all comes down to because of the sin nature, without Jesus Christ, the world is lost in sin. And He is our only solution. And we need to keep preaching that because He's the only light we have left in this world. Otherwise, people will fall into the deep evil and darkness because without Christ, the, 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 the heart of man is evil and wicked above all things. Amen? Um, so I, I pray that uh, people will really uh, focus in on, on, on what God has done to save us and to bring total healing. Jesus' name. Now let's just turn for a second to Revelation. Yeah, Revelation chapter 20, 21. Praise God. Revelation chapter 21. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part which is in the lake which burns with the fire and brimstone which is the second death. Wow. And there was a lot of uh, in-depth stuff we can get into there. But then after that, there's a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And so Revelation chapter 1 and 22 will be uh, what you might want to con say the con consummation of the whole cause, the whole plan of creation and redemption. And we will have the perfect Garden of Eden with the Tree of Life back in, in God's perfect uh, uh, the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Now, before we get to that stage, we're still in this covenant of, uh, we're in a period of grace, dispensation of grace. 
because Christ has already come and God has made a way for us all to experience uh, his perfect his perfect plan of redemption but I'm also going to say that um, um, Show us, Lord God, where you want us to go with this message today, Lord. I thank you, Lord God. We welcome the power of your Holy Spirit today, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, now I know what I wanted to share. I didn't even have it in my notes, but praise God for the Holy Spirit. We've been praying the Lord's Prayer for so many years. Let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So what I believe the Holy Spirit is saying is, yes, this will be the, God's future plan. But even today, we're supposed to be establishing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, right? So the question we need to ask, is there any sickness in heaven? No. Is there any poverty in heaven? No. Is there anything evil or negative in heaven? No. So that means we can establish God's kingdom here and now because of the finished work of the cross of Calvary. We have the ability to establish God's kingdom on earth. And so this is why I believe we can have like a, a, a no sickness zone, a no poverty zone with the body of Christ needs to show that we can bring heaven down to earth and have you know health, wellness, uh, uh, prosperity, and all the things that come with God's word. Uh, and we need to establish heaven on earth, praise God, and that's what God's will is, and, and we know it's going to come fully in its fullness in, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, but we don't have to wait until that point because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, amen? Now, there's one other little thing we need to cover when we get into uh, healing here, because yes, there's a lot of scripture verses. Everyone who came to Jesus was healed. In fact, let's turn for a second to Matthew 14 which was uh, just before that, uh, that story we read this morning with the Canaanite woman. Going back to Matthew chapter 14. And I love the fact that Jesus, his, he had so much compassion, all he could do was heal. It says, uh, everyone who came to them were totally healed. Matthew chapter 14, verse 34. Is everybody there? Say amen if you're there. Matthew 14, 34. It says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. Praise God. And as many, everyone say, and as many, that touched him were made perfectly well. Praise God. Now we know the story of the other woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment and because of her faith, Jesus felt the power leave him. And he says, who touched me? And he said, because of thy faith, you've been made whole. So you can see the power of touch in the power of faith. It pulls that anointing from, from God. And here, it's not only one person who touched him says, but everyone who touched the hem of his garment were healed. So that's the kind of healing virtues and power flowing from Christ. And it's a, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So anyone who can reach out in the spirit and touch him, you can also be received. Whoa, that healing touch. I just feel we released that healing today for anyone watching. Uh, praise God, we're videotaping today because I believe that God can do things. Uh, he's omnipresent can do things and we're believing for many signs wonders and miracles as we preach his word today but let's turn now while we're in the gospels to matthew chapter 8 and this is one of the chapters that completely transformed my life uh years ago when i first came across in my search for truth i was searching and searching and saying you know i want to really know what is god's truth in this world we're living in because there's so many different <laughs> philosophies and things in John chapter 8 is what did it for me. Praise God. If you turn to chapter, uh, verse 12, Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. John and Matthew. Oh, sorry, John. Yeah. John chapter 8, verse 12. It's a passage where Jesus says, uh, He spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, we know that in the uh, utopia of, of Revelation 21 and 22, where it's a perfect world, it says there's no need for the sun because God is our light. He's so bright, He illuminates His whole kingdom. 
but in the world we're still living in, we do have darkness, and, and that's why Jesus said, I am the light of life, because he's, he's the solution to the darkness of the world. But verse 13 says, The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. That's a lie, right? They, they, they don't really know what they're talking about, but Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. So I love the boldness that Jesus had to just speak to them with authority because uh, they didn't really know what they were saying, but he knows what he, he, he is speaking the truth. And then verse 15 says, You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. I love the fact that Jesus is showing his personal relationship with the Father and that uh, he's speaking truth and he's exposing the lies of the Pharisees. And verse 17 says, It is also written in your law, he's now challenging him this by saying, It is now written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Who is your Father? They don't even know. And Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. I love that. He just hits him right in, in, the, in between the eyes with, with the word. Right? He says, You know neither me nor my Father, because if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. So now Jesus is showing them that they don't even know who God is. They don't know his father and they call themselves you know believers and they think that they know god but they don't really know otherwise they would know his son and his in his uh, a plan of redemption so uh verse 20 says these words jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come so again god the father orchestrated all these events in in, in jesus had divine protection on his life until his time came when he knew he had to go to the cross to pay the price for the sins of all mankind but i just love the fact that he's speaking to the religious leaders of their time and he's exposing their evil hearts he's exposing their lies and deception and and we need to expose that as well because there's a lot of i i, I want to pray against the lie of any religious deceptions happening today in the world so we can truly find the spirit of truth who is the holy spirit verse 21 says then jesus said to them again i am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin where I go, you cannot come. So now he's really giving it to them hard, saying you will die in your sin. And, and he's, he's challenging people to repentance. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is preaching to people the truth so that we will repent of our sin and turn and accept God's forgiveness and, and receive salvation. Because otherwise we will all die in our sin if we don't repent. And, and there's no other way to get to heaven except through uh, Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. 22 says, so the Jews said... He will kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come. So they're totally confused. They don't really know. They don't even know what Jesus is even speaking about. He's so far above them. And, and anyway, anyway, verse 23 says, And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. And you are of this world, and I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. Again, he repeats that a second time. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, this is a very powerful challenge. And, and I don't want anyone to have the same fate as the Pharisees of dying in their sins without repenting and receiving forgiveness through the awesome work of God uh, in sending and showing how much He loves us that He sent His Son for all of human uh, mankind. Verse 25, Then they said to Him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but He who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from Him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I, am always, for I always do those things that please Him. As He spoke these words, many believed in Him. Praise God. So again, Jesus clearly spoke the truth and he, and he exposed every lying deception by speaking truth. Amen? And that's what I, I, I believe today we need to do. The, and even in Psalm 43, 3, King David said, he prayed to God, send forth your light and your truth. That's what this world needs today more than anything is God's light and God's truth. And together the light and the truth will expose all lies, all deception, and all darkness. And then your minds will be illuminated to know that God is the only... He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
He is our Creator, Father, and He loves us with everlasting love. Amen. And then finally, my uh, favorite uh, few verses are John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Praise God. The NIV says the truth will set you free. Uh, King James says the truth shall make you free. Any way you look at it, the moment you accept Jesus Christ and your Lord and Savior, you are delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So I see that as being set free. But then there's a sanctification process of you becoming more and more sanctified. like you're, uh, And that's being made free. You're, it's a continual process. Salvation and sanctification. Uh, verse 33 says, They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be you will be made free? Again, they're, they're in such a deception here that they're saying we've been in bondage to no one, but who is ruling Israel at this time? It's the Romans. So they're in bondage to the Romans, just as they were in bondage to the Egyptians and many other uh, uh, people in the past, and yet they're in such a deception. They said we've never been in bondage to no one. They mean while they are. So you can see that self-deception is the worst kind of deception, right? And again, I'm just, John chapter 8 is the, the, the chapter of truth. And that's why I'm really hammering this in today. That the more we speak truth, it will expose every lie and deception in people's hearts. And, and many people have, uh, all of us have, have, have picked up what I call ungodly beliefs over our lifetime, right? And we need to uh, uh, go through sometimes an inner healing or deliverance process to determine if there's anything in our thinking which is not in line with the Word of God, right? Because if there's any ungodly beliefs, that's the first thing people need to identify when they're going through any kind of inner healing or deliverance, is you have to repent and renounce any ungodly belief and receive the promises and truth of God's word. Amen. Verse 34 says, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I love that. 836. If the Son sets you free or makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And verse 37, I'm going to keep reading this because it's so powerful. I think you're all going to love this one. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do not and you do what you have seen with your father. Now Jesus is really exposing their hearts here when he's saying that God is not their father, but he's saying the devil is their father, and you'll see that in a minute. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. But Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So again, you will know them by their fruit. If they're really Abraham's uh, uh, the children, they would act like it, but they're not. Uh, verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. He was a man, Abraham was a man of faith, and they're trying to claim that they're children of Abraham, but yet they're not operating in faith or even the truth. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, "You were not born of fornication." Sorry, they said, "We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God." And Jesus said to them, "If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but He sent me." So again, I'm, I'm going to challenge everyone watching that if you say you believe in God, but you don't accept Jesus Christ as His Lord and Savior, you're in deception. That's all I could say is because if you know God the Father, you will know His plan of redemption through His Son, Jesus Christ. So that clearly exposes many ungodly beliefs out there. Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not just a good person or a good man. He is a Son of God and He is one with the Father. So if you haven't accepted that yet or, or come to that agreement yet, I believe you need to be born again of the Spirit because that's the only way you can truly see Jesus as who He is is when the Holy Spirit comes and, and, and gives you that revelation. Amen.